Good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, the Trusted CI webinar for May 20th, 2024. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is NSF's 2025 Research Infrastructure Guide, also known as the RIG, um, and Information Assurance. Uh, the, our presenter today is Mike Korn from NSF. Mike is the Cybersecurity Advisor for Research Infrastructure, and he's going to be talking about new edits that are being proposed to this RIG. Mike, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Uh, let me go ahead and take this away. I've got a modest number of slides to go through for everyone. I want to uh, give you all a, um, a nice overview of sort of how we approach the rig this year and um, walk you through the thought process a bit and spell out some of the changes from the uh, last version or the current rig as it were. So let me start off by giving you um, a little overview of how we think about cybersecurity at NSF. What are the pressures on us? It's really important to remember that the federal government views research and development as um, critical infrastructure for the United States. And so we view and the government views the major facilities um, and basically the infrastructure funded by NSF as vital national assets is the term that they tend to use. So we take this very seriously. One of the things that I've learned since coming to NSF, it's been just about a year now that I've been here, is that the we tend to think of the major facilities as, well, it's open science, it's off doing domain activities, but the broader impact of the major facilities on the economy, on uh, national competitiveness, even on national security, is much broader than I think most people realize. And so we really look very carefully at uh, uh, cybersecurity because as you know, cybersecurity is a big federal priority these days. I've given you just four of the sort of streams of activity going on. Now you may look at this and look at the National Cybersecurity Implementation Plan or the Zero Trust Strategy and goes, Mike, those are really aimed at uh, federal agencies. Why are you talking about them? Well, the reality is, is that whether it's the federal government or things sponsored by the federal government, cybersecurity is getting a lot of attention and a lot of scrutiny these days. Um, those other two there, the NESPOM 33, um, does call out and impact the cybersecurity practices of organizations funded with federal dollars. And the DOD cybersecurity maturity model is aimed at DOD contractors. So it's not just the federal government, but I'm presenting this to give you a sense of what's in the air around cybersecurity at a federal level. And then of course, for those of you that have been paying attention, uh, in 2021, NSF brought in the JSONs, a group of academics and um, private sector experts to write some advice for them on what they should do about cybersecurity at the major facilities. In fact, my very position was one of the recommendations coming out of that JSONs report. The critical thing that I'll talk about a little bit more later is that the JSONs report said NSF should not get pres prescriptive about cybersecurity, but leave cybersecurity in the hands of the managing organizations of these major facilities and the argument there, and I, we agree with it completely, is that this allows the facilities to tailor their security programs to the nature of the science they do in the nature of the facility. And then of course, the other thing that's sort of shaping the atmosphere at NSF and everywhere is what we see around cybersecurity. Um, you can't open a newspaper or a web page or however you consume your media uh, without seeing about another healthcare facility being crushed by ransomware. Um, it's just all over the place. And of course, the last couple of years, we've seen a couple of major incidents at major NSF funded facilities. And it's important to point out that, well, let me, I'll talk about those a little bit, but, and then in addition, of course, all of us as security or IT practitioners 
are aware of the sheer volume of activity of cyber attacks going on. So what this has really done to us is it's created this yin yang situation where on one hand, we're getting a lot of pressure to be more prescriptive around cybersecurity and impose more regulations. Um, at the same time, we as an organization don't want to be that prescriptive because prescribing an expensive cookie cutter cybersecurity framework is going to impinge, or at least this is what we're afraid of, on the function of science at these facilities. So we're in a situation where, you know, and this is kind of a your face here image, right? We're all trying to balance these two things which seem incompatible. And it's really causing a lot of struggle for the facilities and any security practitioner, I think. So one thing I wanna say, and those of you that have seen me talk before um, have probably seen this slide before, but I would just want, I, I just think it's so important. And I use this slide a lot internal to NSF as well, not just externally. The goal for cybersecurity is not that you are an impenetrable fortness, fortress that never has any sort of cyber incident. That's simply unreasonable in the modern world. Bad things are going to happen if you're on a computer, if you're on the internet these days. What we were looking for are uh, resilient facilities. And by resilient, we mean that you pretty much the stupid stuff, the hundreds of thousands of scans and probes and lightweight automated attacks that we see every minute of the day are just bouncing off your infrastructure. They're not causing you problems. But when the major attacks, the sophisticated ones, get in, and they will, that you can bounce back very quickly and constrain them from destroying your whole facility. I've said this before, but if you get a ransomware attack that knocks you offline for months at a time, that's bad and expensive and embarrassing. If you have a ransomware attack that takes out a few machines and you're back in business in three days or a week, that's a success story. That means your cybersecurity controls are working. And we need to say this to our leadership because frankly, when bad things happen, they tend to panic. Um, the other thing, of course, we wanna do is prevent um, the disruption of scientific operations. It's important to point out that the major facilities are very expensive to run. Now, if you're offline for a couple of months, it's probably not gonna cost a fortune, millions of dollars is, you know, if equipment isn't damaged or science isn't damaged, it isn't like you're writing big checks. But the reality is, if you look at the lifetime of a major facility, which is like 40 years, sort of the planning number, and you look at the 100 to 500 million that's spent in building it, the tens of millions every year that takes to run it, it's on the order of 10 to $100,000 a day to run a major facility. So being knocked offline is a really expensive proposition and there's a lot of lost opportunity costs. So we're really trying to prevent that. And of course, the data you're producing needs to be uh, data integrity protected. So I just wanna, I, I harp on this a little too much probably, but share that message with your leadership if they're not getting it. So where are we going at NSF on cybersecurity? And this is really gonna be the whole point to this talk is we're trying to elevate cybersecurity to be a major first class concern at the facilities. And what that means is we want the leadership of the facilities. All of you know what needs to be done around cybersecurity. You know what you need resources for and you know how to do it. But we need your leadership to understand and acknowledge where there is cyber risk. We need them to understand and acknowledge what they're spending to mitigate that risk and what the costs are to mitigate that risk. And we want them to have some general idea of what the posture of your facility. Too often when something bad happens, and I'm not picking on a major facility, but in any organization, the leadership goes, I thought we had a program. I thought this was all taken care of. And then you've got the cybersecurity professionals or cyber infrastructure professionals going, but I've been telling you I need money to do something for years and you're not listening to me. we got to get past that. So in a nutshell, what you're going to hear me talk about today a bit is we are adding the expectation that cybersecurity risks will be added to the facility risk register. All major facilities have a risk register. 
We're going to be requesting that you break out cybersecurity budgets as part of the review process for major facilities. If you can't count it, you can't control it. And so line iteming your cybersecurity budgets is a very healthy thing for the leadership to see. We're going to provide some guidance around what a security plan is. You'll notice that about the only obligation in your terms and conditions for cybersecurity are that you have a security plan. So I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we're going to detail that. And then we're asking some basic questions about cyber fitness. We've identified a small set of controls. And we're just asking about them. How are you doing on these specific controls? And we're using that as a as leverage for a bunch of conversation. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the research infrastructure guide, uh, let me give you the two second version of it. Here's the snapshot of the current infrastructure guides title page. And you can see it is our guidance for full cycle oversight of the facilities. Now, is the research infrastructure guide a set of requirements? Yeah, a little from pile A, a little from pile B. Um, it is guidance on how to fulfill the requirements. There are very few um, actual requirements in there. And I have to tell you, in this version of the research infrastructure guide, there has been much more attention to the word requirement versus guidance than ever before. So I think you're going to find that a lot clearer because this is the operative word in the research infrastructure guide. Now, I will say just bluntly, there are no hard requirements spelled out for information assurance. It's all guidance on how to meet the requirements. So it doesn't say you absolutely must have to complete a, a information assurance management plan the way it's spelled out here, but it's telling you this is what we would like to see in a, what we used to call the security plan. So let me talk a little bit about how we got here. One of the first things I was asked about when I started at NSF is sort of what's the security posture across the major facilities portfolio? And that was a good question. I went and I talked to some of the folks at Trusted CI. I tried to find the assessments that I could that had been done. Um, the challenge is, is that it's very... What's the right word? It's not a continuous process to get information. So for example, if Trusted CI has done an assessment, that represents a point in time. And also I may not have access to all of the assessments because those are between Trusted CI and the um, uh, particular facility. Um, since they're not part of NSF, they're not documents that I automatically have access to. So what did I do when I had to figure this out? First thing I did is I went into our record system and I said, let's look at the risk registers for all the major facilities. Let's see what they think they're protecting themselves from. And what I discovered is that very few of the facilities have a risk register that includes cybersecurity issues. A couple of them may include one line where it says cybersecurity, bad stuff could happen, do something about it, and not a whole lot more. Um, one or two facilities does do have uh, fairly detailed cyber risk, so kudos to them for doing that, but it's not consistent, and it's worth pointing out, it actually says in my job description that I'm supposed to collate all these risk registers and provide some analysis about what risks the facilities are uh, facing. They're just not listed. So after I looked for that and was kind of disappointed, I said, let's go look at the security plans. Everyone is supposed to have a security plan. Well, the security plans are kind of a hodgepodge. Now, I know many of them have gotten better in the last few years, but what I find is that most of the time when I go look at this, what's called the security plan, um, what we have internal to NSF, it's not a program description. It's often, it's just the document that was provided during the proposal. It may lay out some architectural details. We're going to be secure because we use Amazon this way or we use you know, this particular product. Um, or it may list a bunch of policies that they adhere to. But it doesn't really describe 
what they're doing or provide any evaluation of what they're doing as a cybersecurity program. So what I found for um, security plans, it's really not useful, at least from what I have, uh, for comparing across facilities. And also, remember, a lot of what takes place at NSF after a facility has been funded and, and constructed is annual or biannual or however annual the program manager decides to have a review of the facility and how they're doing. So what usually exists as a security plan is inadequate for the review panel to evaluate if the facility is executing or performing cybersecurity adequately. So then the last thing I did when I realized that wasn't gonna pan out is I went and looked at budgets. And this was a complete mystery. I got, I think a grand total of one, maybe two budgets when I requested it from a PO program officer for a facility. Um, and I remember chatting to several of the folks at Trusted CI who said, yeah, it's really challenging to get budget information for cybersecurity. The reason is, is that it's never been asked for by NSF. Um, there's actually a spot for it in the work breakdown structure, but it's just never been requested or provided for the most part. And so when you ask about cybersecurity costs, what are you spending on cybersecurity? Um, you might get the IT budget, but that doesn't do me any good because I don't really know who's working on what, who's full-time, who's not full-time on cybersecurity. And of course, part of the pressure here is we at NSF would like to provide better guidance to proposers and facilities about um, what they should be spending on cybersecurity. I would love to take, for example, I'll just pick on the telescopes because there's a lot of telescopes and say, this is what typically is spent on a major observatory and you're spending half that. Let's look at, is that adequate or not? So um, right now, if you look at these three things, there's just no way to evaluate how cybersecurity is progressing at any of the major facilities. So if you frame this up, we've got a set of problems. We don't run the facilities. Uh, they're not our, they're not doing government work. And by the way, the rest of the government does not understand this. I've had many conversations with agencies that ask, why aren't the facilities covered by FISMA? Well, they're not government facilities and they're not processing government data, nor are they doing work for NSF. Um, having said that, we are getting asked about why do we don't um, impose more requirements on the facilities by the federal agencies. But it remains the obligation of the managing organization to run, to define, to execute on a cybersecurity program. Also, if we went and put some hard requirements in place, there are real cost implications to doing that. I'll talk about that a little bit further. But finally, we really want to be less prescriptive. The more prescriptive we are, again, to what I said earlier, we're afraid that we're going to end up impacting the operations of science. So this is how we're threading the needle. We are focusing on the rig and the facility review process. Remember the rig is guidance. So we're describing how we feel the obligations need to be met rather than creating new requirements. And part of that is to make sure in the rig, it calls out that the review panels for the facilities or the proposals have the information they need to evaluate facility performance for cybersecurity. So we're providing expanded guidance for uh, uh, the facilities as to what our expectations are. And we have begun asking some questions about specific cybersecurity controls. Um, I can go into that in a little bit as well, but this is how we're threading it. Now, you may be asking, why don't we just impose a control set? And I do have to tell you, hold on, I need a sip of coffee. Um, when I talk to many of you at the uh, various conferences, I get asked all the time, why don't you just impose a standard? It would make our life easier. And I hear this a lot from cybersecurity people for two reasons. They want the clarity, tells you exactly what you have to do. 
And a standard is also a liability shield. If I tell you, um, you must be this high to ride and you're this high and you still fall off of the roller coaster, then it's not your fault anymore. Um, you met the standard, what your expectations were. But if we just impose a standard, then we have to decide which standard it starts becoming very prescriptive again. Um, there are huge cost issues associated with standards that we have to figure out. Even the control set that I'm asking about in the rig, everyone's asking, well, where's the money coming to do any of these things? That's the first question. And the facilities are, are there's a lot of them. If you look at the 18 major facilities, if we put just, if we say you must have a security lead and it must be full time and we're going to pay for it, that's $3 million a year. It's a lot of money. You start adding these kinds of things up, it gets expensive. And I'm not saying we are not looking at those costs. I am advocating as hard as possible within NSF that we need to invest more in cybersecurity. But this is one of the major concerns if we start imposing a standard uh, willy nilly. And of course, I don't want to assume that I can go pick one standard that's going to work for all the facilities. Maybe that's easier than I'm saying, but it seems to fly in the face of allowing localization of the security program to the science, to the facility, if we have one. And then, of course, if we have defined a standard, are we now obligated to audit it? How do we do that? Do we have to now pay for a third party to come in? Self-assessments are valuable, but only to a point. Is there liability associated with it? Are there consequences of not meeting a standard? If we define it and you're not meeting it, do we have to give the facility to a different organization? I mean, you can see there's a lot to unpack here. And I'm not going to tell you we won't ever get to the point where NSF defines a requirement for a framework and a control set. But right now, I think we've got to do the best we can without getting there. I think it's in our interest not to go down this road. Um, because really, all of this seems very prescriptive again. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So let's talk a little bit about the rig specifically. Um, this is a rough outline of what you're going to see in the new rig. Um, pretty basic stuff, to tell you the truth. I don't think there's going to be any surprises for any of you in here. Um, some more, a lot of it is guidance for the leadership of the facilities to try to understand that this isn't 1984 anymore, and we really have to think differently about cybersecurity than they're probably used to. Uh, we talk a little bit about what's going on globally. You know, 20 years ago when I got into cybersecurity for the first time, most of my concern dealt with, oh gosh, you know, music sharing and uh, simple hacks. Nowadays, it's all state actors. If you're at a major institution, you're worrying about adversarial countries as part of your job. We do provide this guidance on the obligations, talking about adding cyber risk to the risk register. Again, we detail what used to be called the security plan is now called the information assurance management plan. We talk about controls. We do talk in a couple of spots about breaking out budgets for cybersecurity. And then the rest of it is really just guidance, suggestions for how to think about your security program. Um, obviously, the trusted CI pillars make up a chunk of this, the four pillars uh, that make up a program. They're as solid as anything you're going to find. I do talk a bit about data management and data curation, and that's in there because many of the organizations um, we deal with don't realize how important a role cybersecurity needs to be in their data management and data curation process especially in an era of open science where you're trying to get things online as quickly as possible. So there's a little bit about that in there. Uh, the difference between information insurance and cyber infrastructure, what their relationship is. We talk a little bit about cyber breach insurance. Um, many of you, uh, your organizations are looking for cyber breach insurance these days. And then a few words about the need to assess your program. Um, of course, how you assess your program is probably going to depend on the kind of program you've got and the challenges that you've got. I talk mostly in here about how to assess yourself against your control standard.
and your progress. Now, one thing I want to show you is I talked about this information assurance management plan. Let me go say a few words about this. These are the what we recommend as the contents for an information assurance management plan. An IAMP is not a policy document per se. It is a runbook, a short description of your uh, information assurance program. Um, to give you an example, I would expect these to be no more than 10, 12 pages long for a major facility. But it's a place where you're going to articulate in writing that this is how we operate our program. This is what framework and control set we've chosen. We're not telling you which framework or control set to use. You want to use Trusted CI's framework? Great. You want to use NIST CSF? Knock yourself out. You want to use the CIS controls for controls? More power to you. But write it down and be aware that you're telling your management and NSF that you're going to adhere to this. You need to document, obviously, your scope and boundaries. I've discovered, uh, much like a university, all of the major facilities exist in an ecosystem of other repositories, other facilities, other computational centers. And you need to really write down in black and white where who's responsible for what interface, where is your the responsibility and handoff take place. And those are the kinds of things that become tribal knowledge. You know them, but they rarely get documented but it's really useful to write it down. Obviously, responsibility model and matrix, how you govern information assurance. Um, I call out the value of something called risk treatment plans. Uh, a risk treatment plan is a uh, document at a fairly high level that describes how you're handling specific, highly visible risks. So for example, Ransomware may be something that you're handling through a whole host of controls uh, that run the gamut from endpoint configuration to backup strategy. But it's very convenient for something that's as in the news and visible as ransomware to have a document called ransomware risk treatment plan, where you summarize all the different controls and activities around ransomware. Now you could do this for a number of different risks. You obviously don't have to do it for everyone but I'm recommending it because it's just a great tool and it's a great tool for your management to see and understand. And then a section describing the things you actually do, your programmatic activities like vulnerability management or inventory, your hard security functions such as network monitoring, um, endpoint hardening. And then if there's anything else that you're asked to do that's just sort of fell to security by chance, uh, a lot of security folks are also worried with um, uh, continuity of operations, even though it's not purely a security function. So you may want to put that in there. And of course, how you plan to assess yourself. So this is what I mean by guidance. We're not saying you absolutely have to have a section called this or you won't be funded. We're saying if you want to have our guidance, if you're putting together a plan that describes your security program, these are the elements you probably want to Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the cyber controls, because I know everyone starts worrying as soon as you mention controls, because they think this is going to become a compliance exercise. I've worked very hard not to make it a compliance exercise. So here's a quote right out of the rig. I'll pause for a second so you can read it. And I forget if I described this or later or not. So I'll go ahead and describe it now. Um, the controls that are listed are not controls that we just made up out of thin air. What I did as part of my um, trying to understand the facilities better was I tried to gather together all the information I could on uh, major incidents at major facilities. And then I went through and analyzed those that those reports that I was able to find. And in those reports, I identified about 14 or so controls that every facility that had a major incident put into place in response to those controls. And it was shocking because 
I would be reading about one. I go, oh, look what the response was. And I'd say, oh, that's the same as the other facility. It's a very consistent set. So what we're doing is not saying you must do this or you won't get funded. But what we're saying is that if you're new research infrastructure, that pre-construction phase, you should be building the costs for these into your budget from the upfront stage, which is obviously where it's cheapest. If you're an existing facility, and this is where it gets challenging because they've been operating some of them for decades, you need to sit down and have a serious conversation with your integrated project team, your NSF program officer, about how and when to get these implemented. What I'd really like to see is, I don't want to see you stop working on everything you're doing. Sometimes security controls are done very opportunistically based on the availability of staff, time, maintenance windows, and you got to take advantage of those. But these are all such critical controls they really should be prioritized. Now, let me say this, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, this isn't a compliance exercise. And I'm going to say this every time we get together or I have a give a talk on this because everyone nods and then they come back at me and say, I have to do this exact control, don't I? The goal here is reducing risk, not compliance. And what that means is that if you have a situation where because of the kind of science you do, the way your facility operates, the kind of facility it is, um, you need, you're like, well, if we do this strictly as it's written, it's going to be a problem or it's going to be too expensive or it's just not physically possible. You need to sit down and find some new or alternative way to lower that risk. And that's the way cybersecurity is supposed to work. We're not really supposed to, in most circumstances, implement all of 853, all 2 billion controls to the T. You're supposed to evaluate risk, identify controls that reduce that risk, and implement those. And a mature facility will do that kind of risk analysis and not just say, oh, we're special, this is hard. And I've been on both sides of this, so I understand. But when you read through controls, whether it's the ones we're suggesting or your own control set, I hope you will bring that kind of flexibility and open thinking to the problem. Or else we're simply going to become another compliance regime, say like HIPAA or CUI or something like that. Now, one thing to note is if you are looking for cyber uh, insurance, you're going to find the insurance companies have no sense of humor about this. They're very black and white. And it's getting almost impossible, for example, to get cyber insurance if you're not using MFA for all remote access. It's just the way the world is today. So, you know, here's again one of those things where we may have some pressure from us saying, be flexible, be creative. If you're getting cyber insurance, it may not be that way. You may be much more bound. So here's the set of controls um, we're recommending. Um, I've grouped them here by uh, roughly target risk. You can see how the colors show. Now, one thing to say is you'll notice I grouped all of the various forms of MFA at the top. In truth, I'm taking this one off the table. And let me go back so you make sure you take a peek at that one multi-factor authentication for laptops and workstations. So for example, to log into this, my NSF workstation, I have to use a smart card. Um, that's great, you wanna do that. It's a good thing to do, but it's a very low risk situation what you're trying to address and it's expensive and difficult to do. So we're not adding that to the list. I just didn't get a chance to update this, this uh, table. Um, but you can see in here, these are a pretty basic set of controls. MFA is obviously the number one thing you should have in place these days in terms of technical controls. Um, everything around backups or network segmentation is all about ransomware and the blast radius. Um, and by the way, I do understand that, and NSF understands that there's a big difference between backups of your research data and backups of your systems. You know, your systems is about getting them back into business quickly if you have a compromise. And you can do that at even a major facility. Um, 
backing up your research data is a horse of a different color. And that can be very, very expensive and difficult and challenging. And that's where there's going to have to be a lot of creativity. I found when I asked the facilities if they were backing up their research data, about half of them said they had this completely under control, about half said it was underway. But when you look at the details, there's a lot of different ways to consider something backed up. Many facilities spread their data to multiple archives uh, redundantly. So it's not backed up in the sense that you send it to a backup vendor or you run it on a separate system, but it effectively is backed up. So you have to, again, take this and look at it very closely at what makes sense in the context of how you operate. System logs, inventorying, uh, vulnerability management, obviously these are high priorities. Um, Anti-malware software, and especially if, to make sure you're paying for an EDR solution as part of your anti-malware solution, incredibly valuable for inspecting your environment. And hardening standards. Now, some of these are more expensive than others, obviously. Network segmentation, depending on how you approach it, could be very expensive. Um, you know, um, my last job, we did this by putting uh, giant firewalls in our distribution nodes and built hundreds and hundreds of VDOMs off of those. Very expensive approach. There are other ways to do it that might be much cheaper or more appropriate, again, for your environment. So... Um, the one thing I will say is that almost all of these, even if they don't take cash outlay, will take resources. And that's the real challenge, I think, especially at the major facilities where, as I mentioned earlier, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars a day sometime, well, maybe $100,000 a day to operate a facility, you get very little downtime. And so many of these controls, um, I'm going to suggest that you take maybe a year or two maybe three to get them in place because you simply don't have those giant maintenance windows where you can do things quickly. And with that, I think I'm ready to open the floor for questions. Jeanette, you said 40 minutes and it looks like I'm pretty close. Awesome. Um, so um, one second, let me just pull up my, okay. um, my slides. So, if you have questions for Mike, um, please go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, and by the way, people are free to reach out to me directly. I've got my email address on there. I'm happy to answer questions one-on-one. Um, -on -one. I will say if you're at a major facility, I do recommend uh, when you reach out to me, you CC your program officer on it, or I will on the reply. I like to make sure that that's your formal pathway for communications to NSF. So we can talk, but I want to make sure the program officers are aware of what we're talking about. Pardon me. I'm just pulling up my um, my community slides real quick here. Sure. You want me to stop sharing? Back. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and grab the screen back. Okay. So um, our next webinar is going to be June 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and our topic is the Transformative 12 with Craig Jans Jackson. Uh, for those of you familiar with Trusted CI, Craig has been a member of Trusted CI for many years. Uh, for more information about us uh, or to um, ask us questions, you can contact us at webinars at trustedci.org. Um, another reminder is that our Cybersecurity Summit is coming up in October, um, that's October 7th through 10th, and it will be in Pittsburgh. And we do have a student program uh, for this event, and these, the call for applications is open. So if you go to trustedci.org slash summit, you'll find information about the location of the event. We don't have a, a call for proposals just yet, but the student program is open. So if you are a mentor and you want to encourage um, participation uh, for one of your mentees, please point them there and, and have them apply. Um, let's see, let's go back and check on the chat here. Um, so it looks like uh, we have a question here, MTA for applications, does this imply planning and government governance around third-party SaaS applications? 
I'm curious about the scope. Um, that was the control saying for all applications to do MFA. Oh yeah, sorry, it was it was a typo MFA. Okay, um, third party apps are one of the hugest problems you've got because some of them only support their own native MFA or they won't support any MFA. I mean, you have to look at this really closely. I would suggest that you do put it and you do think about it for third party apps. Um, you know, it, it's a kind of a question of though of looking at what's the data that's being asked, what's the risk analysis that's going on. If it's your data or it has access to your systems or access to your data, then I definitely think MFA has to be on the table. But I do know this is one of those places where things get very, very tricky. In, in my past, there have been many times I've had to put uh, third-party apps or even local apps behind our VPN, which had MFA, because there's just no sort of logistical way to do it with the third party. So, um, you know, this, this goes to what I was saying earlier, though. This is not a compliance exercise. It's a risk exercise. So take a look at the app and decide, um, you know, should MFA be in play for this particular application? It's a good question. Any other questions for Mike? We've got some time left here. Maybe I answered everything while going through it. Well, what, what should people expect what are the next steps? So the next steps for the rig is that uh, we are, in fact, I think I'm two days late in getting the final, final revisions in. I saw Allison in the uh, uh, participants, and so she's probably tis tisking me right now. Um, we're in the literally the home stretch for making the last changes to the rig. I'm in the process of going through it now and looking for all references to cybersecurity that are left over from quite a while ago and updating them. And um, then sometime in the, um, it'll be, it'll go through some more internal review and then it gets submitted finally to OMB for public comment. Uh, that's a little later this year. Uh, we're obligated to respond to all the public comments. There could be quite a few public comments. And then I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the actual publication date is slated to be around February 25. I think that's the correct date. And that's when it'll go into effect. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, any studies on costs, resources, money, people, power, time versus benefits received and how long to get the benefit? Um, mm -hmm. By size of facility, for example? Uh, we haven't done anything quite like that. That would be an interesting and pretty expansive exercise. Um, I would suggest that might be something uh, Trusted CI could probably tackle or may have comments on in a future presentation. Um, you know, it's always challenging when people ask um, sort of the ROI for these cybersecurity events because... Um, when things are prevented, you don't really end up seeing them as well. It's very difficult to count the, the, the non-events and to tally them up. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you there. I, I mean, I suspect in the professional literature, there's some of this out there, but I've never seen anything that uh, I'm aware of targeting the major facilities directly that really brings the math to the table. That seems like maybe something Craig might touch on because he's got so much experience um, with the framework uh, yeah, project. I, I think that would be a good idea. Um, but I mean, these are always interesting studies. I, I will tell you though, that having worked over the years quite a bit with security researchers that are looking at um, the exactly that question, sort of what is the impact? There's a lot of skepticism about some of our tried and true security practices that we're all very proud of and happy with. Um, so I have the feeling that, you know, the more data-driven the field becomes, uh, the more pressure we're gonna have to, to change. But this is the, the flip side to, at the same time, while everyone is getting more concerned about cybersecurity, they race to impose requirements. 
the notion that you're going to then have a paradigm shift over what are the right requirements is kind of challenging. Uh, so uh, it's going to be an interesting period to be a cybersecurity professional. So touching on that, uh, we have a question here. Will the NSF recommend a control set within the new rig or just require that facilities select one? Require facilities select one. Okay, in your, any other? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, in the information assurance management plan, you do need to articulate what your framework is and what your control set is. And we're staying agnostic on that, allowing you to um, select what makes the most sense for you. Last call for questions for Mike. In the meantime, I want to thank you for giving us time to talk about these changes that are coming. Um, do you have any other uh, last comments for us? No, I just appreciate everyone making the time. I appreciate you allowing me to speak to everybody, Jeanette. And um, uh, thank you. It's been great. Well, everybody who's uh, following along, I will be uh, uh, cutting this recording and posting it later if you want to share it with your colleagues. And uh, I'll also be archiving the slides. So be on the lookout for that. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for attending. And thank you again, Mike. And uh, have a great day.